The Monteverdi Safari is an amazing vehicle in SUV history. It was one of the first luxury off-road cars, coming out way before fancy SUVs from Porsche and Lamborghini became popular. Swiss car maker Peter Monteverdi introduced the Safari in 1976 to go up against the Range Rover, which was the top dog in luxury off-roaders back then. The Safari story starts with the International Harvester Scout, a tough American off-road vehicle. Peter Monteverdi saw potential in the Scout's strong base, but wanted to make it fancier to compete with Range Rover. He teamed up with Carrosseria Fissor, an Italian car designer he'd worked with before to give the Scout a makeover. They changed its look completely, making it sleek and stylish instead of boxy and plain. But it wasn't just about looks. Monteverdi and Fissor worked hard to make the Safari both good-looking and practical. They used steel for the body to make it strong and redid the inside to make it comfy and luxurious. This meant adding nice materials, better soundproofing, and a fancier dashboard. For engines, Monteverdi chose powerful Chrysler V8. The smallest was a 5.2 liter engine, which was much stronger than the Range Rover's 3.5 liter V8. If you wanted even more power, you could get a 7.2 liter Chrysler V8, making the Safari one of the most powerful SUVs of its time. It also had an automatic transmission, which the Range Rover didn't have then. When the Safari came out in 1976, most SUVs were either basic off-roaders or not fancy enough for luxury car buyers. Monteverdi wanted to fill this gap by making a car that could handle tough terrain but still feel like a luxury ride. This was a big deal in the SUV world and paved the way for future luxury SUVs. They made the Safari at Monteverdi's factory in Binningen, Switzerland. Each car was built by hand, which meant they couldn't make many, but it also meant the quality was really high. People who wanted something different from the usual Range Rover started noticing the Safari. The Safari was packed with luxury features that were rare in off-road vehicles back then. The seats were covered in high-quality leather, and you could choose between cloth, fake leather, or full leather for the upholstery. The front seats were bucket style for better support on long drives. The back seat could fit three people comfortably, so the Safari could carry five people in total. The dashboard was another standout feature. It had a new layout with all the important info right where the driver could see it. The middle console had controls for the automatic transmission, the four-wheel drive system, electric windows, and other features. Monteverdi even made a custom steering wheel for the Safari. One of the coolest things about the Safari was its air conditioning, which wasn't standard in many cars back then. It also had power locks and electric windows, which made it really convenient to use. If you wanted to make your Safari even fancier, you could add extras like a sunroof, a TV, a fridge, and a winch for serious off-roading. The Safari wasn't just about luxury, though. It could switch between two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive, depending on where you were driving. This made it good on regular roads and off-road. The suspension was based on the Scout's original design with live axles on leaf springs and shock absorbers, which gave a smooth ride on all types of terrain. The brakes were power disc brakes on the front wheels and drum brakes on the back, which was important for stopping such a big, heavy vehicle. The cooling system was designed to keep the big engine from overheating, even when working hard. The Safari came with alloy wheels and Goodyear Wrangler tires, which were great for off-road driving. It also had spare wheels, so you were ready for long trips. Even small details were important, like using taillights from the Peugeot 504 brake to give the Safari a unique look. The back of the car had a fold-down tailgate and a fold-up window, which made it easy to load stuff, especially when off-road. Monteverdi only made a few hundred safaris between 1976 and 1982. Each one took a lot of time and skill to build. Even though they didn't make many, the Safari became Monteverdi's best-selling model, showing how much people liked it. They only made the Safari as a two-door model, but Monteverdi did make a four-door prototype. This was one of the first four-door luxury SUVs, coming out before the official four-door Range Rover. While they never made many four-door safaris, this led to Monteverdi working with Range Rover in 1980. They started turning two-door Range Rovers into four-door models and selling them through Land Rover dealers. This partnership lasted until 1982 when Range Rover started making their own four-door model. People bought the Safari not just in Switzerland, 
but in other European countries and beyond. It was perfect for rich buyers who wanted something different from the usual SUVs. Monteverdi also made a cheaper version called the Sahara. It looked more like the original Scout, but had some changes like four headlights, a new grille, and Monteverdi badges. The inside was similar to the Safari, but usually not as fancy. You could get the Sahara with the same 5.7 liter V8 engine as the Safari, or even a Nissan diesel engine, though they only made one diesel model. They made even fewer Saharas than Safaris, with only about 30 ever built. Today, car collectors really want well-kept Safaris. They're valuable not just because they're rare, but also because of their unique design and craftsmanship. Being associated with Peter Monteverdi, a pioneer in the car industry, makes them even more special. The Moretti Midimaxi 127 is a fascinating car with an interesting history. It all started with the Moretti Motor Company, founded in 1925 by Giovanni Moretti. At first, they made motorcycles, but after World War II, they switched to making cars. They became known for creating small, custom-built vehicles based on Fiat designs. In the years after the war, Italy's economy was growing fast, and people wanted small, affordable cars. Fiat was making popular models like the 500 and 600. Moretti saw an opportunity and started making special versions of these cars that were sportier and more stylish. This idea worked well for customers who wanted something different from the regular Fiats, but still wanted reliable Fiat engineering. When Fiat introduced the 127 in 1971, Moretti decided to make their own version. The result was the Moretti Midimaxi 127. It wasn't just a small change to the original car, it was a big redesign. Moretti wanted to make a versatile and unique vehicle that would stand out in the market. The Midi Maxi was designed to be an open car without doors. It was perfect for fun activities and ideal for warm weather. You could drive it in busy Italian cities or along beautiful coastal roads. The car could have either a soft canvas top or a hard top, depending on what the owner wanted. The soft top could be rolled back to make the car completely open, which was great for sunny days. The hard top was better for protecting against bad weather. One of the most noticeable things about the Midimaxi was its simple, boxy shape. It had flat panels and not much decoration. This design made the car practical and easy to take care of. The Midimaxi was also a bit higher off the ground than the regular Fiat 127, which made it better for driving on rough roads. Inside the car, everything was basic but worked well. The seats were made to last, even when exposed to sun and rain. The dashboard was simple, with controls and gauges that were easy to see and use. It was comfortable enough for everyday driving, but it was clear that the car was meant more for short trips and fun drives rather than long journeys. The Midi Maxi used the same engine as the Fiat 127. It was a 903 cubic centimeter inline four engine that made about 47 horsepower. This wasn't a lot of power, but it was enough for the lightweight Midi Maxi. The car had a four speed manual transmission which was normal for small cars in the 1970s. It could go up to about 87 miles per hour. Moretti made some changes to the suspension to make the ride more comfortable on bumpy roads. They used independent front suspension with coil springs and a solid rear axle with leaf springs. This setup helped the Midi Maxi handle different types of roads while staying stable and easy to control. One important thing about the Midi Maxi was how light it was. The body panels were made of thin steel to keep the weight down. This made the car use less fuel and made it easier to drive. The whole car weighed about 1,620 pounds. Moretti made a few different versions of the Midi Maxi. The main difference was whether it had a soft top or a hard top. The soft top was more popular because it really showed off the open air design that made the Midi Maxi special. They also made a few other models based on the Fiat 127 like the Moretti 127 Coupe, which was a sportier closed roof version, and the Moretti Paguro, which was a small work vehicle that came as a van or pickup truck. They didn't make very many Midimaxes, only a few hundred were ever built. This was partly because they were aiming for a small market, and also because Moretti was a small company that couldn't make a lot of cars. Each Midimaxi was built by hand, which made every car unique, but also meant they couldn't make very many. Even though they didn't make many, people who bought the Midimaxi really liked it. It was especially popular in countries around the Mediterranean Sea, where the open design was perfect for the warm, sunny weather. 
Some people in other parts of Europe also liked it because it was stylish and fun, and different from normal cars. Today, the Moretti Midimaxi 127 is a rare and valuable collector's car. Because they made so few, it's hard to find one in good condition. This has made them more expensive for people who collect old cars. The Midimaxi is special because it shows how small car companies in the 1970s could take a simple car like the Fiat 127 and turn it into something really unique. The UMM Alter 2 was a tough 4x4 vehicle made in Portugal from 1986 to 1994 by União Metalomecânica UMM. This company started out doing metalwork before getting into making cars. The Alter 2 became well known for being really durable and great at off-roading, which made it popular with everyday people as well as the military and utility sectors across Europe. The story of the Alter 2 starts with designs from a French company called Cornille. In the 1970s, UMM bought the rights to use Cornille's designs outside of France and started making vehicles based on them. These designs were originally meant for farm and utility use, and they were known for being simple, tough, and good at handling rough terrain. UMM introduced the Alter 2 in 1986 as an improved version of their earlier models. They made some big mechanical changes to make it more competitive in the 4x4 market. One of the main improvements was a new four-speed manual gearbox, which gave drivers better control on tough terrain. They also added a new transfer case that helped distribute power to all four wheels better, making it even better at off-roading. The suspension was upgraded too, which made the ride more stable and comfortable, important for both civilian and military users. The Alter 2 was built with a steel ladder frame chassis, which made it really durable. It had a boxy practical body with a steep front end that let drivers see obstacles better. This design wasn't just good for off-roading, it also made the Alter 2 look different from other 4x4s at the time. UMM made the Alter 2 at the Movado factory in Setúbal, Portugal. This location was important because it let UMM use local expertise in metalwork and putting vehicles together. They could make the Alter 2 pretty cheaply, which made it affordable for all kinds of customers, from regular people to government agencies. The Alter 2 came with different engine options to suit different needs. The basic engine was a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated diesel that produced 75 horsepower. This engine was known for being reliable and fuel efficient, which made it popular for utility and farm use where people needed a dependable vehicle for long-term use. It was also pretty simple to maintain, which was important for users in remote areas where it might be hard to find advanced mechanics. UMM also offered more powerful engines. The most common was a 2.5 liter turbo diesel engine, which gave a big boost in power while still being as durable and efficient as the non-turbo version. This engine became standard in many military and police versions of the Alter 2, where they needed extra power for demanding jobs. For those who wanted even more power, UMM offered some petrol engines, including a 3.0 liter V6 that produced 150 horsepower. This engine was especially popular in civilian versions of the Alter 2, where speed and performance were more important. They also had 2.0 liter four-cylinder and 2.9 liter V6 petrol options, which offered a balance between power and fuel economy. The Alter 2 came in different body styles to fit different needs. There were short wheelbase and long wheelbase versions with options for soft tops and hard tops. The long wheelbase versions were especially popular for commercial and military use because they had more cargo space and could carry more passengers or, or equipment. UMM also made a crew cab version with an extended cabin that could fit more passengers, which was great for work crews or military personnel. Throughout its production, UMM kept updating and improving the Alter 2 to keep up with the changing market. In 1987, just a year after it first came out, they added a 2.5 liter turbocharged engine with an intercooler, which made it more powerful and efficient. This was in response to growing demand for more powerful 4x4, especially from military and police customers who needed better performance under heavy loads. Along with the new engine, UMM introduced a 5-speed manual gearbox to replace the earlier 4-speed version. This new transmission made gear changes smoother and improved fuel efficiency at higher speeds, making the Alter 2 better for both on-road and off-road driving. They also added ventilated disc brakes on the front axle, which made the braking better, especially when carrying heavy loads 
or driving at high speeds. The 1987 update also brought some design changes. They added power steering, which made the Alter 2 easier to handle, especially on rough terrain or when carrying heavy loads. They also replaced the original steering wheel with a Momo racing steering wheel, which gave it a more modern and sporty feel. In 1989, UMM introduced a long wheelbase version of the Alter 2. This came in both pickup and soft top styles, catering to customers who needed more cargo space or flexibility. The long wheelbase version quickly became popular in commercial and military markets where the extra space was a big advantage. In the early 1990s, UMM made more updates, including some models with BMW engines. These were part of a limited production run and used advanced engines like the M21 2.4 liter turbo diesel and the M52.5 liter petrol engine. These engines offered more power and better performance, appealing to customers who wanted the toughness of the Alter 2 combined with BMW advanced engineering. In 1993, UMM gave the Alter 2 another facelift. This version had a redesigned dashboard that was more modern and user-friendly than previous versions. They also fixed some electrical problems that earlier models had, making the 1993 version more reliable and easier to use. The suspension was improved again, and they added a new front bumper design, giving the vehicle a slightly updated look. UMM stopped making the Alter 2 for civilian customers in 1994, but they kept filling large orders for military and utility customers until around 1996. These customers included various government agencies across Europe, especially in Portugal and former Portuguese colonies, where the Alter 2 was valued for its toughness and reliability in challenging environments. UMM had to stop production mainly because of money problems and the high cost of developing new models. They had planned to introduce a new model called the Alter 2000, which would have been a more modern and advanced version of the Alter 2, but they didn't have enough money to make it happen. After they stopped making vehicles, UMM went back to focusing on metalwork. The company is still around today, but they don't make cars anymore. Even though they only made about 10,000 Alter 2 at the US, the vehicle is still highly regarded by enthusiasts for its durability and off-road capabilities. Many of these vehicles are still being used today, especially in rural and remote areas where their simple mechanics and tough construction are really valuable. You can still get spare parts for the Alter 2 from specialized suppliers, and there's a dedicated community of owners and enthusiasts who keep the legacy of the UMM Alter 2 alive. The Alter 2 also made a name for itself in motorsports. Several models competed in the Paris Dakar Rally, one of the toughest off-road races in the world. Although it wasn't as famous as some other competitors, the Alter 2 got a reputation for being reliable. There were reports that all the Alter 2s that entered the rally managed to finish, which is pretty impressive given how harsh the race conditions are.